This is the fourth model in the social policy for development planners course for 2022. The model is concerned with the social policy dimensions of, of or implications of international compacts. Compacts of this nature are agreements or propositions among member states of an organization such as the African Union or the United Nations. This will range from the Constitutive Act establishing the organizations to treaties, charters, conventions, covenants, and so on. In some cases, the provisions of an international compact or treaty or a covenant comes to into, into force when a specified number of member states of the organizations have ratified the instrument. For example, the African Continental Trade Free Trade Agreement came into effect on 29th April 2019 when 22 member states of the AU ratified the instrument and the ratification instruments were delivered to the African Union's headquarters. In such cases, the provisions of such instruments are binding and are enforceable on member states that have ratified the instruments. The process of ratifying an international instrument involves domesticating their provisions. In other words, the provisions are incorporated into the national laws of the member states, usually through the national legislative process. A binding national instrument may come with optional protocols. The provisions of such protocols only become binding if the member states ratify them along with the primary instrument. On the other hand, an international compact may not be of the type whose provisions are binding on the member states. In most cases, such international compact involves norm setting and advisory and are advisory in giving guidance to the member states on actions that need to be taken to guide the compact's objective. Most international compacts with social policy content or implications are usually of the non-binding variant. This ranges from specific provisions of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose articles 22, 23, and 25 have specific social policy focus and implications. The same applies to the 1978 Declaration of Alma Ata on the, of the member states of the World Health Organization to promote and protect the health of everyone. In this model, we will focus on two more recent international compacts. The first is the African Union's Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. The second is the United Nations Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, commonly known as Agenda 2030, containing the Sustainable Development Goals. We will be concerned with the two compact social policy components and implications for the social policy for development planners course. In July 2012, Dr. Nkusazana Lamini Zuma was elected the chairperson of the African Union Commission. Our tenure marked the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Organization of African Unity on 25th May, 1963. The African Union's Agenda 2063 was developed as a continental strategic vision during Dr. Dlamini Zuma's tenure and adopted by the AU Heads of State Summit on 25th January 
2015. Agenda 2063 is a 50-year strategic vision program for the African continent for inclusive growth and sustainable development for Africa. The process leading to the adoption of Agenda 2063 was initiated at the January 2013 Assembly of Heads of State, where the AU Commission, the NEPAD Planning and Co Coordinating Agency, the African Development Bank, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa were asked to develop the strategic vision document and plan. The process started with the ministerial retreat of the Executive Council of the AU Commission on Agenda 2063, held from 24th to 26th January 2013 in Bahir Dar, Ethiopia. Following the retreat, a committee of ministers was established to implement the ministerial retreat decision. What followed was an extensive consultation with different groups and individuals on the continent and the diaspora, the regional economic commissions and AU organs to seek opinions on the agenda's contents. Consultation work involved a scoping exercise covering several previous Africa level plans and charters. This range from the Abuja Treaty to the African Charter on Values and Principles of Public Service and Administration and the Accelerated Industrial Development in Africa, among others. Agenda 2063, to quote the documents, seeks to galvanize and unite in action all Africans and the diaspora around the common vision of a peaceful, integrated and prosperous Africa. Harness the continental endowments embodied in its people, history, cultures, natural resources, geographic, geopolitical position to effect equitable and people-centered growth and development build on and accelerate the implementation of continental frameworks and other similar initiatives. Provide in internal coherence and coordination to continental and regional and national frameworks and plans adopted by the AU, the regional economic communities and member states plan and strategies offer policy space for individuals, individual sectoral and collective actions to realize the continental vision, end of quote. The agenda 2063 rests on seven ideal, ideals identified as its pillars, framed by the AU principle of subsidiarity, in other words, delegated responsibility for implementation at the regional and national levels. In operational terms, Agenda 2063 is a rolling plan of long, mid, long <clears throat> medium and short term plans. Its overall span is 50 years with five 10 year plans that could also be, be also broken down into shorter periods of five-year terms on the discretion of each member state. The national level will be responsible for implementation of key activities under Agenda 2063. The regional level, the RECs, will serve as the fulcrum for the implementation at the member state levels. They will adapt at the Agenda 2063 results framework to regional peculiarities and facilitate, coordinate the implementation by member states and develop, implement monitoring and evaluation framework at the regional level. The continental level, AU organs, especially the African Union Commission, will be responsible for setting the broad results framework 
and broad monitoring and evaluation based on inputs from the RECs. The strategic vision is positioned on seven pillars or aspirations. Aspiration one is for a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Aspiration two is an integrated continent, continent politically united based on the ideals of Pan-Africanism. Aspiration three, an Africa of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice, and the rule of law. Aspiration four, a peaceful and secure Africa. Aspiration five, it's an Africa with strong cultural identity, common heritage, values, and ethics. Aspiration six is an Africa, an Africa whose development is people driven, relying on the potential of African people, especially its women and youth and caring for children. Africa aspiration seven is Africa as a strong, united, resilient, and influential global player and partner. As shown in the figure on the screen, each of the aspiration has subcategories or sub aspirations. For, for this, we will focus on aspirations one and six. Under aspiration one, as seven sub aspirations that range from the objective of having by 2063 an Africa with a high standard of living, quality of life and well being, to having well educated citizens that are competent in science, technology, and innovation. The third sub aspiration speaks to having a healthy and well nourished citizens. The fourth Sub-aspiration speaks to having, by 2063, transformed economies. The popular version of the Agenda 2063 document speaks of economies, and I quote, that are structurally transformed to create shared growth, decent jobs, and economic opportunities for all, end of quote. This is related to the creation of, quote, modern agriculture for increased production, productivity and value addition that contributes to farmer and national prosperity and Africa's collective food security, end of quote. Under aspiration one are other objectives related to the blue economy for accelerated economic growth, something quite important for a continent surrounded by oceans on every side. The Mediterranean Sea to the north, the Indian Ocean to the east and the Atlantic Ocean to the West. Finally, the seventh sub aspiration refers to environmentally sustainable climates and resilient economies and communities. Aspiration six is concerned with the objectives of quote, people driven development, end of quote, which speaks to achieving quote, full gender equality in all spheres of life, end of quote, and having engage and empowered youth and children. Notably, the aspiration speaks to the situations in which all citizens quote, of Africa will be actively involved in decision-making in all aspects. An inclusive continent where no child, woman, or man will be left behind or excluded based on gender, political affiliation, religion, ethnic affiliation, locality, age, and other factors, end of quotes. Embedded in the work of the AU generally, and Agenda 2063 is the principle of subsidiarity, which involves the delegation of the process of giving effect to the aspirations to different organs and levels in the constitution of the AU. At the base of giving effect to the principle of subsidiarity are the member states that are expected to incorporate the agenda 
into their national plans. Above these levels are the regional organizations such as the regional economic communities, the RECs, that are expected to incorporate these operational plans the aspirations in the operational plans. Finally, different AU organs are expected to be responsible for giving effect to the aspirations by coordinating the activities of different levels and spheres of activities. To translate the aspirations articulated in Agenda 2063 into deliverables, the intention is to have over 50 years of effort at realizing the aspiration, five 10-year plans. An AU summit adopted the first 10-year plan in June 2015 in South Africa. The plan is expected to run from 2013 to 2023. Among the key transformational outcomes set out that should be achieved by 2023, include the following, achieving, I quote, real per capita incomes that will be a third more than 2013 levels, end of quote. The incidence of hunger, especially among women and the youth, will, only, will be only 20% of 2023 level. Job opportunities being available to at least one in four persons looking for work at least one out of every three children will have access to kindergarten education with every child of secondary school age in school and seven out of 10 of its graduates without access to tertiary education being enrolled in TVET programs. Under these indicative aspirations are issues relating to reducing malnutrition, maternal, child and neonatal death, access to safe drinking waters to 90% of the population, and so on. The objective of having a transformed, inclusive and sustainable economies speak of having GDP growth rate of 7%, with, I quote, at least a third of the output generated by national firms, end of quote. Others include, I quote, labor-intensive manufacturing, which is underpinned by value addition to commodities and doubling of the total agricultural factor productivity uh, being attained by 2023, end of quote. Concerning the aspiration for empowered youth, women, and children, the plan speaks about the removal by 2023 of I quote, all obstacles to women owning, inheriting properties or, or business, signing a contract, owning or managing a bank account. One in five women is envisioned to, I quote, have access to and control over productive assets, end of quote. The plan identified 12 priority projects to be implemented within the first 10 year plan period. Uh, this include uh, the Africa Integrated High Speed Rail Network, the African Commodity Strategy, the creation of the Continental Free Trade Area, the Pan African E University, the African Passport and Free Movement of People, silencing the guns by 2020 the implementation of the Grand Inga Dam project, the creation of an annual consultative platform for policy dialogue, the single African air transport market, outer space, Pan-African virtual university, and continental financial institutions. The integrated high-speed train, train network is expected to connect all the capitals and the major commercial centers of African countries. The commodity strategy aims to ensure that African countries shift towards increased value added activities to their commodities, which will allow for the extraction of higher rent 
and integration into the global value chains. The continental free trade area is to allow for free trade among member states was expected to be operational by 2023. The African Virtual and E-University in effect emerging of projects four and 11 is to increase access to tertiary and continuing education by prospective students. The issuing of African passport is to go hand in hand with the free movement of people on the continent. Laws that traditionally restrict free movement was supposed to be changed by 2018. Notable projects include the Grand Inga Dam project in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which was supposed to generate 43,200 megawatts of electricity that will go into the regional power pool. Others vary from creating a single African air transport market, greater exploitation of outer space, satellite technology for climate forecast, remote sensing, and so on, to, establish, to the establishment of African financial institutions to accelerate the continent's integration and mobilize resources for economic activities. Agenda 2063 can be evaluated as a norm-setting effort and an attempt to create concrete development plans to achieve the aspiration it sets out. Even as a norm-setting effort, the agenda is uneven in the timeline it sets to achieve its aspirations. Others are left to be achieved as of the strategic vision period 2063. At the end of the strategic period 2063, often missing are deliverables at specific timelines in say the first 10 year plans. Assessed as a plan, the vision document falls far short of what will be expected of a development plan. For instance, Aspiration One speaks of inclusive growth and sustainable development of economies that are structurally transformed to create shared growth, decent jobs, and economic opportunities for all. These, while these are all commonplace phrases and soundbites in the international development community, glaring is that A, no coherent industrial policy is offered in the document, B, no framework is provided for making available the educations and the skills necessary for, I quote, the well-educated and skilled citizens underpinned by science and technology, or how no child misses school due to poverty or any form of discrimination, end of quote. The idea of, and I quote, the modernized, modernized infrastructure and people having access to affordable and decent housing including housing finance, together with all the basic necessities of life, such as water, sanitation, energy, and public transport, and so on, end of quote. These are important aspirations, but the nature of the development plan is a coherent statement and programmatic framework for how this will be realized in practice. Remarkably, Despite the claims of extensive scoping exercise of previous instruments of the African Union and the OAU, Agenda 2063 does not reference or speak to the African Union social policy framework, the organization's attempt at developing a social policy agenda for the continent. Neither does the agenda speak to the Lagos Plan of Action of 1980. The first 10 years plan often comes across as a collage of vanity projects and low hanging fruit. For instance, while inspirational, the high speed train network to connect all member states, political and economic capital comes across as a vanity project. More importantly, there is no clear plan for its implementation. Without the endogenous research and development and manufacturing capacity, to make it a reality. Such an enormous project 
that is import dependent, even if it can be funded entirely from domestic resources rather than foreign loans, will have the effect of further exacerbating the continent's balance of payment crisis. A project of such magnitude will also require enormous capacity for cross-border coordination and minor issues such as land rights for the rail track path. The agenda does not offer insight to how it proposes to attend to such matters. The slippage in language into inclusive growth rather than inclusive development suggests a lack of attention to the significant differences between them. A strategic vision agenda that speaks of the transformation of the economy, technological capacity, etc., has to be concerned with development rather than simply growth. The former is concerned with the structural transformation of an economy with innovative and robust manufacturing capacity underpinned by a strong research and innovation competencies in contrast, all that is required for growth is a quantitative increase in output of an economy, a petroleum-based economy increasing output to earn more foreign exchange or increase in international price of crude oil or increase in the production of coffee or cocoa or increase prices to generate more foreign earnings. Finally, the injunction set out in Aspiration 6 for development that is people-centered may be necessary for setting the norm. Still, more is required for a clear articulation of how you arrive at such states of affairs. We shift our attention now to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. On 25th September 2015, nine months after the AU summit adopted the Agenda 2063, the General Assembly of the United Nations in New York adopted Resolution 70-1, Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The Sustainable Development Goals, which emanated from Resolution 70-1, was the successor instrument to the Millennium Development Goals that expired on 2015. In 2015, ostensibly the MDGs arose from the Resolution 55/2, the United Nations Millennium Declaration, Declaration, adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations on, 20, on 18 September 2000. In several ways, the MDGs aimed at a lower threshold of human aspiration than the Declaration. The MDGs were specifically concerned with and targeted at developing countries with a terminal date of accomplishment of 2015. By contrast, the SDGs are intended to be more global in its reach an application and embrace a more ambitious agenda for the subsequent 15 years with new agendas and goals. The MDG's eight goals range from eradicating extreme poverty and hunger to improving maternal health and establishing a global partnership for development. By contrast, the SDGs involve 17 goals that range from no poverty to provision of good health and well being, quality education, gender equality, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure reduced inequalities, and partnership for achieving the goals. While the MDGs had 21 targets and 60 indicators, the SDGs are more expansive and more extensive, with 169 targets and 232 indicators. 
the process of developing the SDGs was also far more inclusive than in the case of the SDGs, uh, MDGs. While the MDGs, MDGs was primarily the product of a small group of technical experts, the SDGs emerged from the United Nations Open Working Group's work made up of 30 member states, members representing 70 countries. The drafting itself drew input from an extensive consultation process involving 193 United Nations member states, civil society bodies, academic experts, and private sector and other stakeholders. Further, while the MDGs were concerned with the with a proportional reduction in extreme poverty, the SDG seeks to eliminate extreme poverty. The SDGs are mainly focused on social inclusion, economic growth, better health, environmental protection, and so on. They are also about strengthening equity and human rights and non-discrimination in, in a sense much more than the MDGs. The SDGs take a more holistic approach to development, economic, political, and social through an inclusive approach to developing and enhancing uh, human well-being. It is essential to note that in the case of education, where the, the MDGs were concerned with quantitative increases in basic access, SDG is concerned with the quality of education and the role of education in achieving a more humane world. In the model slides, we focus, we are focused on presenting the detailed statements of the goals that are immediately relevant to social policy and the concerns of social policy in the context of development planning. Uh, we offer details of SDG 1, SDG 2, SDG 3, which talks about ensure healthy lives, promote well-being for all at all ages with multiple uh, uh, sub-goals that need to be implemented. Uh, SDG 4, which talks about ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting life learn lifelong learning opportunities for all. Um, with seven sub uh, um, goals as well as uh, uh, aspirations. Uh, SDG 5, which addresses um, gender equality uh, and, and ranges from issues about end all forms of crimination, discrimination against all women and girls everywhere uh, to the elimination of all forms of violence against women and girls um, uh, to, to ensuring universal access to sexual and reproductive health and productive reproductive rights. Uh, SDG 6, we talks about clean water and sanitation um, and ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation uh, you know, for all. Uh, SDG 7 talks about ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all uh, with two subsidiary uh, goals, um, including that by 2030, you ensure universal access to affordable, reliable, 
and modern energy services uh, to you know that by 2030 will double the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency to you know uh, SDG eight. Uh, we talks about promoting sustainable, sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. Uh, and and goes on uh, to, with to to set out a uh, uh, ten uh, sub uh, goals uh, under the. Uh, the, the SDG 8 goal of decent work and economic growth. To so SDG 9 that talks about industry innovation and infrastructure, which is concerned with building resilient infrastructure, promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization and fostering um, uh, innovation. And, and it talks about developing quality, reliable, sustainable and resilient infrastructure, including regional and transborder infrastructure to promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization uh, by 2030, significantly raising industry share of employment and gross domestic product in line with national circumstances and double its share in least development in developed uh, you know countries. Um, on two, and then again, you know, that by 2030, uh, we upgrade infrastructure and retrofit industries to make them sustainable with increased resource use, efficiency, and greater adoption of clean and environmentally sound technologies and industrial processes. Uh, SDG 10 talks about uh, the goal of reducing inequalities within and among you know uh, countries um, and uh, SDG 11 uh, we talks about you know making cities and human settlements inclusive safe and resilient and sustainable and SDG 16 we talks about peace justice and strong institution. Uh, which ranges from uh, significantly reducing all forms of violence and related death to substantially reducing corruption and bribery in all their forms uh, to promote and enforce non-discriminatory laws and policies for sustainable development. In many ways, the SDGs are about norm setting but with clear targets and indicators against which to measure efforts at achieving the goals. Inherent in the compact is the principle of subsidiarity requiring implementation at national, regional, and international levels. Much of the actual realization of the goals and national level responsibilities to mobilize international support to supplement the primary resources needed for the implementation which are national. Here, we highlight crucial social policy areas of health, education, averting hunger, promoting gender equality, enabling equitable access to clean water, decent habitats, and an inclusive labor market that involves uh, decent jobs that offer living wages and adequate social security. The targets and indicators allow member states the basis for measuring their performances and setting even more ambitious goals. Significantly, the SDGs identified the imperative of industrialization, innovation, research and development, in driving the economy and guaranteeing human well-being. The focus on the environmentally sustainable or you know sustainability underscores the point that such industrialization of effort will not be at the expense of the environment. 
It is also linked to full employment and decent jobs. The demand for moving micro, small, and medium enterprises out of the economic informality is also crucial in ensuring decent jobs for those operating in such enterprises. Nonetheless, it is important to be aware that when SDG 1 speaks about ending poverty in all its forms everywhere, this is about extreme poverty. Where MDG 1 talked about reducing the number of people in extreme poverty by half by 2015, the SDG 1 talks about eliminating extreme poverty by 2030. Notably, the measure of extreme poverty offered is the $1.25 per day per person. It is a measure of poverty that is so dear that it is a measure of the horror of human deprivation. As I argued about a decade ago, $1.26, which will see extreme poverty eliminated, could in January 2010, afford the individual only a loaf of bread and a bottle of water in the small town in which I was living at the time in South Africa. Note that after meeting what will today be the objective of target one under SDG one, the individual concern will be homeless and naked. Contrary to the international community effusive claims, such norm setting will still involve a lower sense of dignity that we attach to every human life. The actual effort should be in seeking to eliminate poverty and deprivation in all its forms everywhere. Nonetheless, the SDGs offer an expansive approach to the nexus of social policy and development, and joining the world to leave no one behind should be the abiding vision of every development planner embracing the orientation of transformative social policy. There are considerable lessons that Africa and the world should learn from the experience of COVID-19 pandemic for building a post-pandemic recovery that is inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. While the impact of the pandemic in terms of hospitalization and fatality might have been considerably less than initially projected, the, the quality and coverage rates of the health systems were important for coping with the pandemic. This speaks to response capacity and the level of pre-pandemic investment in healthcare facilities and personnel. Recovery in the post-pandemic period costs for both the level and quality of investment in national health systems, as well as addressing the question of access to quality healthcare. The latter is particularly important for inclusive access to healthcare services. Related to the question of a robust healthcare system and surveillance is the need for investment in the training and retention of healthcare workers. Investment in healthcare systems and ensuring equitable access calls for pursuit of a robust development agenda that is focused on industrial manufacturing capacity and investment in a national, in a national, in na national research capacity. These are fundamental for sustainable national capacity to respond to national healthcare needs. Building a resilient national capacity for innovation and manufacturing is important for the routine dimensions of meeting human needs, but also for the capacity of a country to meet the challenges of future cases of epidemics and pandemics. The development challenges of enhancing the productivity of its citizens and the economy requires moving micro and small enterprises out of informality. Beyond providing, beyond improving the productive capacity of the economy, increased formalization of the sector will be important in enhancing the reach of social insurance schemes and the coverage of, pop, of, the, of the population. This will be important for more inclusive and resilient recovery 
from the pandemic. A key lesson for the pandemic, from the pandemic for the post-pandemic recovery, recovery efforts involves the need to shift the discourse of vulnerability and poverty to involve a great, a higher idea of human worth beyond the current obsession with extreme poverty. A post-pandemic era that is inclusive and sustainable requires a focus on human security throughout the life cycle. The principle of leaving no one behind cannot be based on appallingly low levels of social assistance adopted by many of our governments when thinking of addressing the scourge of poverty. Social assistance schemes that are no more than the daily cost of a loaf of bread cannot be considered dignifying or worthy of, of decent living. A post-pandemic era that is inclusive and sustainable, one in which no one is left behind, calls for development of expansive social policy architecture that secures people against the vagaries of life and the market. I thank you. <laughs>